Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Robin. I'm the director of the Downtown Development Authority, and I think I know almost all of you. Um, we're pleased to have with us today Joe Minicozzi, and uh, he's uh, including Fort Collins in a growing string of communities that across the nation, um, including several here in Colorado, where he's completed a special analysis uh, that has looked at the value of different types of development patterns. Uh, simply by using public records of land and taxation data, Joe focuses uh, a unique lens on urban and suburban development patterns. His approach will, I think, perhaps provide us with a new metric for measuring the impact of our decisions as we strive for our collective community vision and create that strong sense of place that um, has truly proven vitally important in achieving the success during revitalization of our downtown. You're going to see in the data that Joe discusses that, that the downtown provides a grounding to help understand the value of the central business district. And as we look to the future and consider additional opportunities uh, for investment and supporting efforts related to the caretaking of the downtown area, we should also be looking to the future in another way um, with respect to that we also have an opportunity for shaping the development pattern along the Mason Corridor um, and supporting the MAX Bus Rapid Transit uh, project with infill projects that's uh, achieve a similar development pattern uh, to the downtown. Among us in the room today are many uh, various stakeholders representing an array of community interests, and those include private businesses, local government, uh, redevelopment agencies, downtown marketing and promotions, community marketing agencies. And I invite you to engage Joe's analysis in, with your own observations and determine what it means to you as individuals and as representatives of your respective organizations and companies. Please remember, the findings of, uh, uh, are simply data, and now's the time to be inquisitive with this data and explore what it means. Joe's no stranger to being challenged with tough questions, so I invite you to interact with him in this way. Um, what I'd like to do now is introduce our guest speaker. Joe Minicozzi is the principal of the consulting firm Urban3 LLC. And it's a firm that specializes in land, land value economics, property tax analysis, and community design. Joe's a founding member of the Asheville Design Center, a uh, nonprofit community design center dedicated to creating livable communities across all of Western North Carolina. He received his Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Miami and Master's in Architecture and Urban Design from Harvard University. He's most recently served as the Interim Director for the Asheville Downtown Association and the New Projects Director for Public Interest Projects. Before moving to Asheville, he was the primary administer, administrator of the form-based code. And that is, for those of you who don't know, that's a specific type of land use code, a little bit different than the one we have here in Fort Collins. And he administered that in downtown West Palm Beach, Florida. Joe's cross-training and city planning in the public and private sectors, as well in the private real estate finance, has allowed him to develop a specific analytic tool that have garnered national attention in outlets such as Planetizen, the Wall Street Journal, the American Planning Association's Planning Magazine, New Urban News, National Association of Realtors, Atlantic Cities, and the Center for Clean Air Policy's Growing Wealthier Report. Joe's work has been featured at conferences of the Congress for New Urbanism, the American Planning Association, New Partners for Smart Growth, and in a few weeks he'll be off to the International Association of Assessing Officers National Con International Conference. Um, and the reason being is that his message is being viewed as a significant paradigm shift for thinking about infill, urban, and suburban development patterns. With that, I'd like to welcome Joe. Thank you. This is kind of fun to be, be here in Fort Collins, especially what's going on in Asheville these days, um, now that we have one of your own, New Belgium, uh, moving to Asheville. This, by the way, this is Asheville. This is our downtown. And you can see why they call it the Smoky Mountains when the fog comes in and gets trapped in the, in the valley. Um, so New Belgium is moving to Asheville, or opening up a shop in Asheville. And this is kind of funny. This, we have a very strong buy local movement, which is this is our, one of our logos that we have. Local is the new, new black. And this was kind of an interesting pun that, that is, New Belgium isn't necessarily a local beer to us, but they are moving in our community. They were actually welcomed with open arms uh, from our Brewers Association. Um, I've been telling people when they knew that I was coming here, I said that I'm, I'm actually a sleeper cell um, <laughs> coming here to steal Odell's Brewery next. There's, when I look at cities, um, many things, the way that I, I view cities is a lot like DNA. And there are a lot of things that you all do great here. Um, it's kind of hard to be in this presentation with an incredible uh, live uh, example of good urbanism right out these doors that a lot of cities don't have. I just came from Modesto. I'm on my way to Casper. Um, those two cities could really use what you all have here. 
And the, the, the lesson is simple. If you want to know how I started, this is how I started. And this is how I'm going to grow up, right? So <laughs> there's a lot of things I can't do to change that path. Cities are no different. You know, when you go around and you look at other cities and you see how they've grown up, how they've matured, what are things you learned from them? What have you learned from Denver? And I'm sure you all have that conversation. More importantly, I look at this guy um, who's had a six bypass heart surgery. And I know that that's going to be part of my genetic material. So I have to do things to eat right and um, exercise and do stuff like that to grow smart to not have his heart attack. So that's the first takeaway on cities. I'm putting it right up front. Um, what can you learn from Asheville? What can we learn from you all? What do you learn from Denver? Um, so Asheville, we're kind of tucked in the mountains here. We're, we're actually closer to Knoxville than Charlotte. Um, and the history of Asheville, here's how we started in the 1800s. This is a shot down Main Street. Um, we had horses too. And um, this is 30 years later. We, re we experienced a tremendously rapid growth in the 1920s. We like to say it's the three T's, trains, tourism, and tuberculosis made Asheville, that once the trains came in, all of these people flooded in. And uh, there was this center of, center of the, the, the hub of uh, the state. We had the largest trolley lines in the entire uh, country, or second largest, sorry, only to Richmond. Uh, presidents visited us, uh, presidents still visit us. But during that period, we grew up in population of 20% every year during the decade, which is tremendously, tremendous growth. We achieved the highest debt per capita in the entire country. That was another winner for us. We we're the second largest city in North Carolina. Um, the city, when the, I mean, this is very much like what we just went through with the, uh, the recession. Uh, when the depression hit, the city thought it had um, $5 million in the bank. Once they were investigated, they found out that they only had $18,000 in the bank. So the whole city council and the mayor got indicted. Three days after the indictment came down, the mayor committed suicide. Um, for those of you that know the famous author Thomas Wolfe, he was from Asheville. And, um, wasn't exactly everybody's favorite person. He wrote a book uh, called Look Homeward Angel that was basically a, a, a non-fictional piece on Asheville, and he just changed everybody's names. So he, was, he liked to criticize them, but this is what he said when the indictment came down. Asheville has squandered fabulous sums. They've flung away earnings of a lifetime. They've mortgaged those of a generation to come. They've ruined, they have ruined a city, and in doing so, they have ruined themselves, their children, and their children's children. This is something I think about constantly because there's still an undercurrent inside Asheville of we don't want to go into debt, we don't want to do big things. We remember the 1920s. Those children are still around. And that's something that we have as a leadership issue in our community. So from 1930 to 1976, not much happened in Asheville. And once we got out of that, boy, did we start running. We, we did our highways. We plowed a highway through the north side of town. Um, incidentally, this is our city hall and this is our county building. This is the Crosstown Expressway. And the coup de grace is when we um, ripped open the mountain, which allowed everything to drain out of downtown. All of that energy drained out, the mall happened, and downtown died. These are shots of downtown. This is from the 1980s, 1990s. I'm going to go through a series of slides. And I tell people, pedestrians are the canary in the coal mine for urban environments. So if you want to tell the relative health of your community, just see if you see a pedestrian. So we can go ahead and count these, just go through these slides and just tell me when you see a pedestrian. Oh, by the way, wouldn't you love to move here and invest in this community? You know, isn't this great? And we had all this incredible stock that we couldn't affo afford to tear down, but it just sat there vacant, all these upper stories. Our answer was aluminum. We just covered things up and forgot about it. This is our downtown. Um, I mean, still, has anybody seen a pedestrian yet? It's crazy. So those children's children, were in leadership. Anytime somebody moved to town and said, we can fix a building, this was like a Greek course. This was, this, that'll never work here. Don't even try. We don't want to go back to that urbanism. It killed us before. And it was really kind of a shallow discussion. But that's what a lot of people were dealing with with our renovation of, of our downtown. Um, some people did try. Uh, John Lancius uh, is probably the key person in fixing our downtown from the private sector. A developer from Charlotte showed up and gave, pitched the idea of doing a downtown mall which ripped out about six or eight blocks of downtown. Uh, to do this, it had to take a public street. They had to publicly finance this massive parking garage that's like three quarters of a mile long. John went out and educated the community on why this was a bad idea. When it went to public, public vote, it lost 70 to 30. So 70% of the community said, don't do that, fix our downtown. That changed the political leadership. Our mayor installed a uh, city manager focused on downtown management, focused on fixing downtown. And he installed um, 
internally to City Hall a, a downtown director, Leslie Anderson, that was kind of a mixture of what you all have, but inside, inside downtown. We didn't have the leadership to do what you all did here. You know, so they just went forward inside city government. Incidentally, uh, there was a repercussion of that and a backlash um, in the 90s, and we call it the Gang of Four. Four people got swept into office, and they dismantled the whole thing. On the private sector side, Roger McGuire is probably one of the key figures up in the top left here. And Roger was a retired executive from Southern Living Magazine. He had been all around the South. He had been to all these beautiful cities, and he said, why can't we do this here? Why can't we be New Orleans, Savannah, or Charleston? And what he, he started doing a lot of civic things, leading community workshops. He sponsored the Urban Trail. This is one of his design sessions. But what he's key for is he put his own money at risk and renovated a building to make housing. And this set the market. This proved that it could be done. He wasn't able to get a loan from a bank. They said, no one will live downtown because no one lives downtown. Right? So that was their thinking. He made the market happen. Our firm was started by Julian Price. Julian Price was philanthropically minded, and he took his inheritance and basically started a real estate development company. It's a for-profit real estate development company called Public Interest Projects. Our firm does 75% of our investment goes into the sticks and bricks, the buildings, and then we reserve 25% to seed entrepreneurs. We find the crazy people who have cool ideas, like um, Hector, who has the best burrito in town, and we invested in him to make Salsa's restaurant. Uh, the Laughing Seed, uh, Joe and Joan Eckert couldn't get a loan from the bank because every time they went to the bank and showed their vegetarian menu, the bank said, well, where's your barbecue? This is North Carolina. People eat barbecue. And they said, well, we're, ve we're vegetarians. We don't. So we sponsored them, started their business, and they've since uh, that ship has launched. So it's kind of an interesting kind of firm, the way that we engage things. Um, but also, Julian was an advocate for uh, community education. So we have that aspect of our firm as well. So this is one of our projects before and after. And when we did this, this building, this was the old Asheville Hotel, uh, we were told we were crazy because we were doing 400 to 600 square foot apartments. You know, usually when I go and present to people in different communities, I usually get a look of shock in the audience, 400 to 600 square foot apartments. And I'll say to the audience, well, who lives in a 400 to 600? Anybody in this room? We got one? But if I change the question and say, who has lived in a 400 to 600 square foot apartment? Pretty much everybody's hands go up. And it was funny, we, we were able to operate off 100% equity, so we didn't have to go to the bank. And for us, we didn't do a market study. We basically said there's 20 units in here. There's 70 something thousand people in Asheville. Surely, we can find 20 people that would live in a 600 square foot apartment. And this has been 99% leased up ever since. The latest project we're doing is a cooperative public-private venture with the city, uh, where there's a parking deck, a public parking deck in here. And we wrap the whole thing with two, well, three other projects. We were approached by a hotel developer that wanted to buy our land, and we dragged them to the table with the city and did this larger project. We're going we're gonna to handle that mixed use on the back, and then this thing, we still don't know what it is, uh, but we had to mass it out. Um, but the fun thing about doing something this complex is that you end up doing things like this. This is a, a three-dimensional model of the legal agreement. And we're trying to explain to people, well, how does this all work? And the attorneys kept on stepping out there, and you watch everybody's faces melt. They're like, oh my god, what are you talking about? Um, so we just drew up this little, like this is the city's fee simple, this is the city's easement under our property, and then this is our air rights over the top of the city, is the way that that works. And then the hotel has air rights over the top of our project, so we can't go up and block their views. And it's just, there's a way to kind of draw it simply, which gets to this image. Our ability to communicate to the citizens we spend a lot of time doing that, and that's something that my challenge to professionals that work in the public sphere is this is key. How do you communicate policy, and how do you communicate the impact to the citizens? I find this is one of the most beautiful images ever. Um, so here, here he is talking about taxes. So there's our bill, and then there's their bill. He doesn't even bother putting a number on the chart. You know, this could be a, a 50 cent difference or a $5 million difference. But he's doing what's, what's necessary to communicate to the, red, to the audience which is there's a difference in the policies. So my challenge through this whole presentation is to show you some pretty complex stuff, but try to do it as simply as possible. Uh, this is what was happening in Asheville from 1991 to today. These first two steps are just by filling up all of those existing buildings that you saw, all of that stock that we had sitting there. So our portfolio of our community was sitting there ripe for the taking. It just needed to be fixed. We started getting new buildings around here. So, again, you all already experienced this. You have a lot of buildings you've renovated. There's still plenty more you could do. And by focusing on that, that's, that's latent wealth in your community that's just sitting there. 
what we saw with retail taxes, now we don't have the same level of detail that you all have. It's actually illegal to find out what happens at the retail level beyond the county. So you can't tell what city's producing what. Well, actually you could up until 2009. But you definitely can't know what's going on inside the city. It's really kind of comical. Um, when, when I come here, it's just, it's like data's falling from the sky. But um, this, is, uh, this is our county's population growth in red. So there's no spike in people moving, at, moving to the county. And then this is the county's retail revenue. Now, as we saw from this chart, you see that downtown pretty much takes off in 2000. So we're seeing this huge bump in 2000 where it takes off. And we do know that 75% of our retail of our entire county is made up in Asheville. So what, what, you know, what I like to say to people is this, if you take that top piece, those, these last eight years, that equals the entire previous 30 years of retail growth. So that downtown, those small purchases can be huge, powerful impacts in the community. Which leads me to think about land production. When farmers talk about land, they think of it on a per acre basis. What's the cost of uh, fertilizing, watering, and what's the crop yield? What's the crop density inside that acre? And how, how does it pay, play in the marketplace? And I wonder, why don't we do that with cities? Why don't we think about the growth patterns of cities and how to, how to compare them? So when we did this renovation here, incidentally, in Asheville, there's really no middle ground. It's just hard left people and hard right people. We're hated on both sides. Some of my friends think because I'm a developer, I have horns growing out of my head. And other, develop, other, other people think that because we're downtown, we're somehow subsidized. Because the market wants the suburban development. And so to prove the point, this is the gift that the city gave us. They invested in a streetscape project, and this is our portion that we got. We had a couple benches, a bike rack, a garbage can, and a street tree. Probably about $25,000 worth of investment in front of our front door. We fixed this building, ground story retail, second story office, and then condos above. In the books, it was $300,000. When we finished, it was $11 million. So for the same building that was sitting there in the community's portfolio, it grew by 3,500%. That's not our money. That's the money that goes to the public coffers that, rise, that rose up. So the public got a return on investment of 3,500%. That's a pretty good return on a $25,000 investment. The other thing that happens is people, they'll see the Walmart and they'll go, well, that's $20 million worth of value. That's real exciting. You know, that's a lot of money, big number. Here's my house. These are my dogs. They think they're lions. But this is, um, <laughs> I, I pay $2,000 in taxes. I'm on a tenth of an acre. So on a per acre basis, my neighborhood's paying $20,000 an acre in taxes versus that. See, we look at the big number and we don't divide the, that, the tax bill that comes out of this tax value by the 34 acres that it's consumed to get there. But when you break it down, it's only 6,500. My, my neighborhood's better than that. And then look at downtown. It's $634,000. Um, this is a good joke that I get to use in Colorado. I, I, I usually tell people, like, what would you rather grow? Wheat, soybeans, or marijuana? Now, if you only had an acre of land, you go for the cash crop. So let's remove me because I don't sell anything in my house. There's retail taxes. And again, the misnomer is people, again, focus on the big number of retail sales. But the portion that our city gets is 27 cents on the 8 cent sales tax. Now, we don't get as much as you all get, but that's all we get. So when you run the numbers on that, that's $47,000 an acre. Add that to the property tax. And this is the total tax take of this, of this property, of this crop. This is just the property tax that goes to the city. You add the retail tax, now you're cooking with gas, um, jobs per acre. You just fit more stuff in less space. And this is, a, one of my friends calls this the Moneyball shot. Have you all seen the movie Moneyball? Um, where they just use statistics to look at baseball players. There it is. This is just statistics. It's just numbers. And what we've done is we've made the, the, the land the apples to apples comparison. So you're able to just fit more stuff. on. This one also has residence per acre too, which is kind of nice. What do, how do we think about land? How do we think about our role in that? And what we do from either the public sector or the private sector? And um, I like to read this bottom line for folks. Incorporation is the forming of a new corporation. The corporation may be a business, a nonprofit organization, a sports club, or a government of a new city or town. Y'all are incorporated. You're a business. You've got a board of directors. You've got a CEO. The county does as well. So why aren't we having that conversation about the cash flow of our community and our quantity of land, because that's all you have. That's your widget. There's a bubble of land, and that's all you've got. I mean, even more so here, we don't have a growth boundary. So there's an exchange of services for taxation. So I buy into that corporate uh, boundary by moving here. 
And people tell me when I go to planning conferences, they're like, Joe, you don't understand, land is limitless, we can stretch out. And they, it's kind of true, but it's really not. Every square inch of our country is made up in corporations called counties. And inside those corporations, there's smaller corporations called municipalities. Or another way of thinking of it is the citizen's a shareholder in two corporations, right? And it's just, it's just that simple. So the commodity at which these two corporations function is essentially one huge real estate uh, firm. So knowing where your money goes and knowing how your money flows is part of how you keep that business functioning. And when a developer builds this godforsaken place in Arizona somewhere, it's really hideous. But if I were to build this, I keep track of everything, all the soft costs, all the hard costs, and then I just divide it by the number of rooftops. And that's how I develop the property. So I know my costs, and then I charge appropriate, accordingly. When this thing gets plugged onto this road, does the public sector do the same thing? Do they figure out the police, fire, school, and do they, do they charge the tax rate that is comparative with the cost that goes to the to public burden? And as most of you know, the answer is no. We, we base things on the value of property, not necessarily the consumption. But I'm not the first person to get onto this. It's actually this guy here um, with this document, Cost of Sprawl, that he produced in 1974. Now, it's, I, I think, do we all remember Richard Nixon as this uh, screaming hippie that wanted to stop the sprawl. You know, it's, this, he was on to it with, by saying, look, there's a cost of government here, and land use pattern is directly correlated to it. There's a reason why citizens, communities are, have, are struggling in the early 70s, and a lot of it has to do with the way that we grow. This was later updated in the year 2000 by Rutgers University. Notice the same name, the cost of sprawl. They took the 24 million households coming to America and growing in America uh, in this 25-year period, and they said, well, this is what it's going to cost. And if we go with smart growth, this is the savings here. Now, incidentally, they only, they only chose 30% of the market accepting smart growth. I was kind of a little flummoxed by this. I was like, that's it? I mean, it's still billions of dollars of savings, but that's nothing. But when I called the researcher to validate that I got this chart right, and he said, it was, yeah, this is right, I was like, dude, uh, what's up with this? This cost, revenue, there's a big gap here in both of these. Who has a business in here? When, when you run your business, if this is your cost of running your business and this is your revenue, how long are you going to be in business? And I was like, what's up with that? I mean, how does government stay in business? And he's like, well, that's because we use permits and fees to make up that gap. Now, that's, that works great in a boom. But what happens when the music stops? What happens when that recession's here? You know, the city manager pulls out a machete, walks over to each department, and is like, give me 5%, give me 5%, give me 5%, or 10 And that's how we make our government work. Now, is, does that, is that efficient? What happened to that promise of services that we have in our community? And this is the thing that's kind of blown my mind about all of this. You're not alone. We're not alone in that. This happened in Asheville. If anybody has any kind of schadenfreude, which is finding pleasure in other people's pain, um, Google broken budgets, and you'll find some municipality that's laying off like 300 people. Um, it's happening all over. It's because that's the way our system, we've set it up. So we were asked to go down to Sarasota to do a similar study. We found their, their state actually has a growth manual that itemizes out the public cost of uh, public facilities per residential dwelling unit. And you see, these are real places from downtown Orlando to downtown or to outside of Fort Lauderdale somewhere. And as you spread people out, that cost gets expensive. The same mile of pipe has less people on it. The pipe costs the same, relatively. So the density affects cost. So we found two similar patterns in Sarasota and went back and costed out development. So we took 300 units of multifamily, 357 units, and said, what if we replace them in the downtown with units that already exist? How do you make it apples to apples? So dark green is downtown pattern, light green is suburban pattern. For the same 357 units of people, you'll consume 10 times the land in a suburban pattern versus an urban pattern. Now remember, that boundary is all you have. For the same number of people, why would you blow through more of your portfolio? Then it costs you. 57% as much to service them in the downtown, in a downtown pattern versus a suburban pattern. Yet you make 830% more money out of it. So in my world, in development world, when we start businesses, every business sits on its own bottom. Every cash flow focuses on its own tub. So it's all just its own little closed loop. If we were to do the same thing where this is the mortgage and this is your payment annually and this is your mortgage and this is your payment annually, how long will it take you to pay off each? So it takes 42 years to pay off the suburban pattern versus three years to pay off the urban pattern. Now what happens is you can't catch up to this. This is a tremendous amount of time in anybody's life, let alone a city. It's 42 years, that's four decades, just to catch up. So we run, the, we run numbers called re, you know, return on investment uh, 
what's the what's the the cost, the revenue, and the time, and it's basically an 18% return rate over a 2% return rate. So if y'all could invest in any typology, what would you rather have, an 18% return or a 2% return? And these are questions we should be asking as we develop cities. Now, somebody in, uh, it was, I think it was Driggs, Idaho, they said, just show it to me in year 20. I don't care about all those bars. So in year 20, you would have made 34 million bucks off the urban pattern, and you're still in the hole five million bucks in the suburban pattern. So we also go into the way that our community functions on a per acre basis. And, and this is, everybody in the city is a county resident, and we like to remind our county of that. So here's the county. This is just the county's tax take of different properties. A city resident, a county resident, we like to pick on the Biltmore Estate. They're lovely county taxes they pay per acre. Um, so you'll notice one thing. First of all, the city residents pay more county taxes than the, than the county resident. Then you bring the mall in, and you'd see why somebody would go after the mall. This is the mall versus residential. So you see this tremendous growth once you get into commercial. We just took that into the downtown, and then here's our building in downtown versus the mall. And what's kind of crazy is, are these two here. This is just a two to four story building, and this is a three to four story building. So we go from $8,000 an acre up to $44,000 an acre in county revenue. In Sarasota, we turned that sideways because it just got a little obscene at like with these taller buildings. And they have their, this is their Walmart up here. This is their bad mall. This is their good mall. Their good mall is at $22,000 an acre. This has the Williams Sonoma in it and stuff like that. Um, but what's kind of crazy is this building here, four times the value, and it's not even occupied on the second floor. So if they just spent a little bit of time fixing that upper story or helping them out or trying to find out what's wrong there, they could grow this from $92,000 an acre of return to 120. When we talk about cars, we don't say what's the miles per tank, do we? If we did, we'd all be driving Ford F-150s. Yet we do this with architecture and buildings all the time. We, we get distracted by these large investments. Instead, I say, well, what's the miles per gallon? Now, all of a sudden, the numbers change. I didn't change the cars. The numbers changed. We should all be driving BMW Assetas at 70 miles per gallon. And if we're doing this for a commodity that only costs 4 to $5, Shouldn't we be doing this to commodities that cost forty to fifty thousand dollars? That's all you have. This is all your gas is just land. So that's why we focus on this. And the, the Sonoran Institute picked this up uh, back in two thousand and nine, and they've been taking us around the West. And that we did uh, Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Um, by the way, this is a great group. They focus on data. That's all they're interested in is bringing data to communities, and an educated populace will make the right decision about their growth patterns. Their finance director. If you all could do this in your community, this is spectacular. They took, they took all the retail sales revenue. She bubbled off. The, this is the downtown. These are just different retail strips. And um, you can see like the downtown produces $1.1 million in, in retail sales. They even put the acreages of those properties. I called up the finance director and I proposed to her. I was like, this is amazing. You're awesome. I need to marry you. And um, she thought I was a dork. But <laughs> and I, this is, this is, like I said, this is illegal in North Carolina. We are not allowed to do this. And for me, this was a, a, a new threshold of information. When, when she found out that it was illegal, she goes, well, how do you people make decisions in North Carolina? I was like, well, well, welcome to North Carolina. That's the way we are. So what's not fair about this data, though, is think about your downtown. How much of your downtown is taxable? How much of your downtown is actually selling stuff? And in their case, their downtown has city buildings, county buildings, state buildings, churches. Once you start pulling it apart, only about 40% of their downtown is actually producing revenue. So 40% of 100, so 40 acres, are producing 1.1 million. Now you compare that to the Walmart down here, and 41 acres are producing 1.7. So their little downtown is actually killing it and keeping up with the Walmart. We tend to take these uh, subjective thoughts into what a Walmart is versus a downtown, but we never match the little purchases up against each other. So their little downtown, three-story height limit, this is it, and this is how they chart out. So here's... This was kind of interesting. Here's their county resident, the average taxes per acre that a county resident pays. And in county taxes, this is what a city resident pays in county taxes per acre. I thought that was pretty spectacular. Um, but much better than all of their commercial. Um, here's their Walmart, their Target, and then you get into their downtown stuff here. And um, in a Colorado, you all have a very interesting tax system from a property tax standpoint. Um, Having just come from California, I'll tell you, you don't hold a candle to California. They are wacky. But there's a lot of states that have this kind of uh, suppressed 
property tax system. You're not alone. You're actually doing better than California. Um, but when you add the retail tax, you'll see why Target is a performer. The retail tax is bringing more to the community than the property tax. But it's still nowhere near what just the property tax does to their downtown. Now, mind you, this is just their county's revenue. It's not the city's revenue. So if you were to look at just what the city got, you'd see the city on, on Walmart pulled about 136000 an acre versus their 5000 an acre in uh, property tax. So that's why somebody would focus on a target, in the, especially in a municipality. So the total, the total take to the city is about 141000 But then you look at the, the total take on one of the little buildings downtown, and it's pulling 157. And again, we just have to make these things apples to apples and put them on a level playing field to understand what the return is. So um, the other thing that was kind of interesting, thinking locally, that we changed all of the values to the location of ownership. And you see that as you come into the downtown, these are all local people that own that real estate. So they have the most return on wealth to the community. They also have the most at stake. These people don't leave when their store goes down. They try to reinvent themselves. They stay. Their families are in the little league teams and stuff like that. And somebody asked me, they said, well, do you hate Walmart? I said, no, this is just, you've got to look at this stuff because it's showing you where you have loopholes in your policy. It's showing you they need to take that money back to New York and back to Arkansas. They need to make money in your community, which is great, but still it's, use it to your advantage. You just have to understand how they function. This little building right here, which would, no one would even blink at, is only $287,000 worth of value. But if you had a half acre of that, let's say not even a four-tenths of an acre of that building, it would equal the entire revenue of the 15-acre Kmart site. So less than half an acre equals 15 acres. And you can see how constrained they are with their land. They're in the middle of a valley. So um, in Columbia, just for the heck of it, I want to throw, that, throw this in here because this is just kind of funny. Um, here's their target. Here's their retail sales coming out of target versus property. And we looked at the Starbucks. This is the property tax coming out of the Starbucks. This is the retail tax coming out of Starbucks. And I said to them, I'm like, y'all must really like coffee. You know, they don't have a coffee culture there. But, it, but again, this shows you the small purchases, the power of small purchases. How often does somebody buy a coffee versus their trip to Target? And so you're getting that same $100 out of people faster out of your downtown, out of these little places. There are different purchases, but, but still, it's, you, you don't overlook these little, these little things. So we're going to close on you all, Fort Collins. I made a comparative beer map of uh, Asheville's downtown and your downtown, your new Belgium, our new Belgium. Your, your downtown's worth about, let's say, $300, $300 million of total value. You're on 126 acres. Our downtown's worth $670 million, and we're on 300 acres. So we're three times the size and um, about three times the value. Our taxable, our, our, our market value per acre is about $4 million an acre. Your market value is very close to ours. It's, uh, again, around yeah, 3.8 and 3.8. We're actually almost identical there. It's like kind, of, kind of fun. Um, but when you, when you look at your core in here, we stripped away the edges of your CBD and just looked around the core that basically around these four brewery spots, or three brewery spots, your core bumps up to about $5.7 million an acre. That little part of the historic area, once you strip out the edges, shoots up to 5.7. So that's, that's good. It's real good. I'm not going to go into this, but we're going to leave these maps here with you all. We made these uh, land value maps, stripping the buildings off and just looking at the land. So you can see where all the, the value of the land is, and you can see how it starts to fade out as you go off in a, in a harmony down here. And then this is the total value map of downtown, this is the, the campus, and then here's harmony down here. This is the mall right about there. Looking a little bit closer, you see, the, again, the downtown, you see hot shades of purple. And then as you head down college, it, it really it goes from about, on average, about $4 million an acre, and it drops to about $100,000 an acre once you get into about here, which is a tremendous fall off. But if you throw this map on the top of this, here's the campus to locate yourself. As you go down to the mall, you're, you're again down at $100,000 an acre of value. So really, it's just giving you very little return in property value as you go down there. To kind of do it as bubbles, this is, uh, this is at the high end. This is um, Front Range Village at about $1.6 million of assessed value. So that's the high end. And then in the low end, you get something like uh, 
this is Harmony Marketplace at about $300,000 an acre in value. Um, this is kind of interesting. The Hilton's at about $85,000 an acre of value. West Prospect Strip is actually better off than the mall. So here's the mall. The entire mall together is about $170,000 an acre of value. It's a great opportunity, by the way, for redevelopment. Here's your downtown, just to kind of lay the map on it, and here's the core that we looked at. So the entire downtown is about $1.6 million. So remember that mall is $170,000. So this is $170,000. This is $1.6 million. And if you just look at the core around this red area, that's $2.3 million of value per acre. So um, to put the mall at the same scale as the downtown, um, the whole CBD here is about 126 acres. The mall is about 107 acres. It's worth $71 million. This whole area here is worth, where are we at, uh, $295 million. If you just focus on the core inside here, the core is 27 acres, yet it's worth 151. So it's almost double the value of the mall, and it's, what's 107 divided by 27? Uh, less than about a quarter of the acre size. So for one quarter of the area, you're making double the money. Um, it's hard to take pictures of these things because they're so huge. So this is um, Technology Park, the Hewlett Packard site, is, is about $71,000 an acre of value. As you get out to Front Range Village, it bumps up to about $300,000. So remember that, from 71 to 300,000, when you get into the downtown, you're going from 1.6 million in value to about $6 million in value out of little buildings. And the, these, two, these two folks here are, are kind, of, kind of interesting because they don't really pop out as valuable when you drive by them, but they're incredibly valuable from a density standpoint. Um, then you have the Linden Hotel is about $4 million an acre, and this is about 3.2. This is more valuable than the new construction. Using your tax tables, you've got your city tax is about half the county's tax. And here's your chart. I'll just walk through the whole thing. This is the city tax. So county resident obviously pays nothing in city taxes. Technology Park, city single family residential, the Hilton, uh, city multifamily, Walmart, Front Range, um, LeMay Total. So that's the Walmart by itself. And this is the Walmart plus all of its strip stuff. This is the Drake strip. So we're up to about $2,000. Um, Front Range Village, the Foothills Mall total. Is it 3000 an acre of, of revenue to you all? Um, West Prospect, Pine Street Lofts. So this is just a residential property, purely residential is what blue means. Um, this is your average for your central business district. This is the savings condos. This is your CBD core. Um, Cherry Street condos, uh, 209 Meldum. Or was it Medlam? Medlam. 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 Uh, Cortina Condos, Opera Building. Um, this is actually the old bank that's actually um, Ingredients, where the Ingredients building is. Uh, Linden Hotel, Old Town Lofts, 125 South, South College, and then this is the Mitchell Block is the most valuable. So you add the retail tax on and you see how the city gets a tremendous amount of retail tax out of those two properties. Far better than this. But when you just look at it against the property tax of stuff in your downtown, it's actually competing. The whole front range per acre return is equal to about the Old Town Lofts. What's kind of interesting, I don't know if you noticed this, but watch the numbers double when you get into the county. So the same, the same ski slope, the numbers double. So now we're going from, from let's say, $700 an acre to the city here to about $63,000 an acre to the city. Now we're at $1,000 to the county, $1,600, to $146,000 an acre to the county. The lesson here is what's good for downtown is great for the city, but it's incredible for the county. You know, and this is the kind of conversation to have with your county leaders. Oh, by the way, since we have some school people here, I didn't, I didn't get into the school district information. When I do this, I typically just stick at the general fund data uh, because Schools get messy um, with, the, with the control in that. And, and, and generally, the greater amount of millage goes to the school. But this isn't about building schools. It's about maintaining. It's about the, it's about the cost of handling the city outside of schools. So basically, if you had 21 acres of that building, you would equal the entire, I think this is the entire revenue of the Foothills Mall. So this takes 66 acres to, to create. And then 21 acres of that, you would have the entire 
bucket of cash. Um, if you're just looking at property tax, if you just had seven acres of that thing, Cherry Street, you would equal the 47 acre strip around Drake, which is from the Kmart uh, past the, um, I don't know how far north it goes, from Whole Foods, that was a Bradley Bar? Spradley Bar. Spradley Bar. So it's a tremendous area, but this is all, that retail has passed past it. It just leapfrogs out to the edge. So this stuff actually, you start to see the retail drop off on these kinds of things. So in closing, think about your land like farmers. Think about the way that farmers are now looking at land. They have this stuff called precision agriculture, where they use GPS to kind of figure out you know, where the vegetation density is, what kind of crop stress you're having, and they program the tractors to put the fertilizer and water only where it needs to be. They're very efficient about those resources. Why aren't we doing the same thing with cities? Why aren't we using the GIS tools and analytical device to see where the hot spots are? And, and take something like the Drake Strip here and say, well, you know, what does it take to fertilize that and make it grow up, grow up the chain? How do we put fertilizer on that, or how do we fertilize the crops that are actually doing quite well to have their environment going as well. So that's kind of one of the lessons here. We've done this all across the country and mashing them up. Everybody's looks the same. This is your county single family, city single family, Walmart, mall. Then once you start getting upper stories, it really starts to take off. You're getting a higher bang for your buck out of that density. And there was a time when we knew this. This is actually from a kid's book on city planning in 1932. V is for value not measured in wealth. Planners think wisely weigh in comfort and health. And we used to plan for value. We used to plan for that density capture. And we've kind of lost that skill. We just need to bring it back into the conversation. We didn't emerge from the savanna with tax policy. It's not genetic to us. And if you find that it's harming you, find ways to work with it or change it. In England, you were taxed on your windows for 100 years. And the more windows you had, the more shillings you paid. And what people started doing is they started boarding up their windows. And they threw the tax policy out. In France, you were taxed upon everything but the roof. And this architect, Francois Mansart, came up with this way of sticking stories up in the roof. And when the tax assessor came out, he goes, you cannot tax me. That is the roof, clearly. And it was a loophole. And they changed the tax policy. But um, I'm constantly wondering about these policies. Any kind of regulation that we put in, is there an effect that happens? You know, there was a time when, we, when I started practicing planning, we used to mandate 2.5 parking spaces per residential unit. In my downtown in Asheville, we have no parking requirements. That works better for us. So know that your tax code isn't written on a stone tablet. These are conversations that you can have. Um, and if it's affecting you, talk about it. And we're dealing with, you know, I like to let people know that there's, if you're, gonna really, if you're really serious about moving the mouse, you've got to move the cheese. There are far too many incentives to build out there versus in your downtown core. Um, they may be explicit, an easier zoning process. They may be hidden, a discount rate on, on the amount of land you have. So that's uh, basically the whole presentation, and I'll open it up to Q&A. My wife is a behavior analyst. She specializes in human behavior. And there's a practice called um, behavioral economics. And back to the, uh, the cheese analogy. So, so if, if I've got an incentive to eat cheese, I'll eat it. You know, if there's something built into the system, I'll go after that. And the, the, I think the question to ask beyond what you've just asked me is where does demand start? You know, if I make it cheaper, would I choose, would I make that choice? If I had to pay $8,000 extra in taxes to have a, a big backyard, would I still want the big backyard? And what I learned in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, this is, uh, this is the mall here. This is just the land value per acre. So we've stripped off the building just looking at the dirt. And you know, what most of us would realize is like, let's take this neighborhood up here that my land per acre would be the same as the neighbor across the street. On a per acre basis, it should be the same. It's on the same street. Yet, when you look over here, as soon as you cross the street, it goes up $35,000 an acre. And the county's assessor was sitting in the front row. She goes, you don't understand that the more land you have, the lower the value. I, I, I laughed. I was like, really, seriously? I mean, in, in my world in development, the more land I have, the more stuff I could put on it. So what happens, and I, and I, I said to her, I said, what, ha what you're doing there is you're giving me a discount rate to chew through more land. You'll give me a lower tax value if I consume more real estate. So when this stuff gets built out here, I think the question to ask is why is it cheap? You know, it's getting, it's getting a, it, does this make sense? Um, so it's, it's getting a lower value, a lower carrying cost than somebody who takes the effort to build on an on a eighth of an acre in downtown. That that value is off the charts where this is given a, a discount because it's big. 
And that's why that stuff happens, is that these developers have things built into the system that are inherently subsidies. It's not a subsidy that we're used to, like you go to a public meeting, everybody yells at me because I'm a developer, and I, the mayor signs something and I leave with my density bonus, right? This is a subsidy that's built into the system of how we operate our cash flow. And these are things that need to be discussed as well, because it makes it really difficult for a developer to make that choice. It's, I'm, rewar I'm rewarded in spades by chewing, chewing through bigger properties at the edge of your town. Why aren't the offices happening? What can you learn from downtown? It's not just the offices. Once those office users are in place, where do they eat? Where do they get coffee? You know, what are these other opportunities for your community to make those ingredients work together there? You know, those, it doesn't necessarily need to be in a suburban office plex. You know, you can still mix those ingredients to have more revenue in the community, more spin-off. You know, it's, it, find some way to work the parking out so that you're minimizing the impact of the footprint. Don't just allow the big surface parking lots, but find a way to cap, find a way to fit more stuff in less space. But there are opportunities, and not everybody's a, a, an end user that wants to be in the downtown. I agree with that. But those are opportunities for building better places in those in those environments. And it, again, it's what they're not paying is that cost of somebody getting in their car, driving down to the Wendy's, and then driving back. You know, that all that public cost is hidden. And, and the community still has to carry that cost. I was kind of blown away that y'all don't have meters on your street. Um, that basically the, the most expensive parking is cheap. You know, we, we flipped, and, and again, I know, that the I know the political ramifications of saying that out loud anywhere. You know, it was, it was, a, it was a battle in Asheville. Um, what we did is we did our first two hours free in the parking decks, put the meters in, and um, it's kind of, I don't want to say slowly turning up the water, the, the heat on the water with the frog in the pot kind of thing, but that's basically what happened is they slowly crept up the parking meter revenues and slowly backed off the subsidy in the parking decks. Now we're still at an hour of free parking in the parking garages, but the parking decks that we built in our downtown um, paid themselves off, I think, like 10 years ahead of their bond. So people got used to it. Um, and that's the thing. Just because somebody says they want something doesn't mean you give it to them. You know, it's, do we do that with our children? We'd be handing them cookies all day long. It's just, but yet we have that behavior where we feel that we need to do that in the downtown. Um, and it doesn't necessarily work all the time. But, it, but again, it's, every downtown is different. I don't know what it's going to take politically to have that conversation here. Um, I don't know if I'll get assassinated when I leave the room uh, by either your merchants or um, anybody else. But that's, that's the pl easiest place to start. Um, if you could, I mean, talk to Donald Shoup. Uh, he wrote the High Cost of Free Parking um, document. I don't know if you all have seen that. That's a good book. He's a, he's a very entertaining speaker on the topic. But you really should have that conversation. Um, because, again, there's, there's a lot of cheese out there encouraging me to park for free. But you, I do, the caveat to this is you have an incredible amount of bicycle activity, and those people take that load off the system. So you can fit how many bicycles in one parking space? I kind of like 12 in front of the trailhead bar. Um, so although at night there's a lot more. Um, but that's the thing is, is that you can fit more and less space. That makes the infrastructure more efficient. Um, because currently the way that the tax system works, it's like if you, if you fix up a stone building, it's more expensive to have that value of a stone building versus new construction. It just can't catch up. So on a dollar per dollar basis, you get a bigger bang out of these older buildings. But it'll, you'll still, I mean, it's really, somebody, somebody asked me, you know, how, how do you think about this? And the way I think about it is if you pull, pull all of your money out of your wallet and either stack it up or put it side by side, and what do you make out of, out of the, the table that you just sat on or set, set the money on? When you stack it, when you do multi-story, you're bringing in multiple layers of revenue on, on one property. Really, you guys are doing awesome. You've got great examples here. You've proven the market. And no, one's, no one's died of some failure of gravity when this thing got built. You know, so you've shown that this stuff can work in your community and that, that people are, are moving into it. So the consumer demand's there. Um, so you just have to focus on doing more of it. You just get more return on that. Well, what's 48 divided by 7? Who's good with math real quick? 6. So 6 times the value between the two on a per acre basis. You know, you're, you're talking to somebody that the city and the county constantly sue each other. Um, so 
one of the, that's one of the reasons why we did this is to let them know that hey we're county residents. In fact, I've had one of my county commissioners uh, say we're making these decisions for the county, not the city. And we're like, well, last time I checked, I voted for the county as well. Um, so it's it's hard for me to understand the perspective. I think this is magical that your county even has a conversation about TIF. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to answer that. But I would, you know, j just I think showing them this is, is going to draw their attention. Do we have any county officials in the room? Um, you know, this is starting the dialogue by seeing this and making it simple so they see the bang for the buck out of it. It's just having them at the table. When I did this in Glenwood Springs, it was, it was kind of funny because it was mostly uh, downtown, their downtown uh, uh, organization that was in the room. There's probably about 100 people. And when they saw this chart of their county's revenue from their downtown, they got angry and they were like, you know, pulling spears out and getting ready to march down to the county. And, and I said to them, I'm like, hold on a minute. I said, in this room, out of the 100 people in this room, when's the last time you attended a county commission meeting? In, the, in this last year, let's say. One hand went up. And I said, look, if you're not having the dialogue, if you don't have them at the table, they don't know what your issues are or what your concerns are. And you have to constantly involve them. So in, in our county, that's the failure, is that we've got two voters outside the city limits for every one voter inside the city limits. So we're upside down politically, and we just can't win that battle. Um, so you don't have that that problem here, but I think it, you know, and it's I think we were having this conversation. There are different types of retail dollars. You know, this is uh, Josh hit the nail on the head when he called this more of a discretionary retail happens down here, and this is more of your commodities of staples. Though I think one of the things to look at is your Ace Hardware. You've got two Ace Hardwares in this community. I'd compare them both, see how they do on a per acre basis. You know, that's a good way to that's a good way to leaven it. And say, yeah, not everybody wants to shop downtown, but there are people spending money at that Ace Hardware. If they weren't, they wouldn't be in business. You know, I think the, the, the thing is here is constantly challenge yourself to think diversely. Don't think about how you operate or how you shop, but think about that you're a community of, what, 121,000 people? So there's a lot of people here. What's it cost you to maintain that street in front of their property on an annual basis? What's it cost you to run that bus by their property on an annual basis and charge them for it? They'll, choose, they'll, they'll change their, their model as soon as the cost is there. What they're doing, they're going to give you the lowest, the lowest value. I'm going to develop the cheapest thing I can develop. So if you're going to give me a reward for building a metal box, I'm going to do it. But if you put those costs at my front door and say, look, we've invested in all this damn infrastructure around here. The only way we're going to make this bus work is if we have the density. If you choose to do something under our expectations, we still have to foot the bill. So that's the impact fee on an annual basis. Not this one time just when you pull your permit. This is an ongoing cost to us in the community, and we can't shoulder that burden. I mean, I, I'll have to be honest with you. This what you're seeing here only, you know, other than the conferences I've done, there's only been you know, 15, 16 other communities that have done this. So this is, you know, this is changing the way people talk about things. But you know, I, I, I wonder about that. It's like, why don't we have? annual impact fees. Does anybody do the cost analysis? The gentleman that was before me on the um, American Planning Association conference last week, his name is Charles Marone. Um, Charles and I are looking for, we're, we actually might be working in um, Omaha together. He does the costing side and I do the revenue side. And that's the presentation that we did. He depressed the hell out of me. He was showing these, these um, suburban developments where it was your typical, you know, kidney bean road that goes in there. And the, the developer was building all of the units and building the public road and then handling all of the construction and then the city took on the maintenance. And so here's the deal, all this luxury housing that's out there, how much, does, how much does it cost the road from an annual maintenance perspective? So that road's got a useful life of, 60 year, or of 30 years, but it takes 60 years to pay off the cost of all the maintenance. So just by taking on the maintenance, you're upside down day one. And the only way you can cover that cost is by getting new permits. Those are the, the charts that I was showing you. The reason why it worked the way that it did is because of the desperation that that community was in. Um, I thought it was incredibly efficient. We got 4,000 units of housing in our downtown in four years. Um, but it was also timing. We hit the market quickly. I think the fastest building permit I gave was 15 minutes in the door and out. Um, but it was incredibly predictable. It was easy to understand. But that was a culture, that's the culture of Florida. You know, it's. I'm an advocate of form-based codes just from a standpoint of clarity. 
that, that oftentimes you get these zoning codes, and I haven't seen your zoning code, so I don't understand, I don't know, but in Asheville's, it's really complex, it's difficult to understand. I call them the clerics in the planning department understand it, but no one else does. Um, and if you can't put it on six pieces of paper and give me all my rules, then it's not worth having a, a book this big. That's just my, my I can, I, just for fun, just show the planning department, I took 72 pages of text and knocked it down to four pages of information because of all the redundancy that's built into zoning code. So this form-based code, there's, there's the form aspects of it, but the real secret weapon in form-based codes is the communication device. Um, and the, more, the, the, the quicker you communicate, the easier it is to get permits and get things built and get what you want built. Well, thank you. <laughs>